so Richard, uh, you, you mentioned that already. Uh, of course, it's nice to have options, uh, but but way too many. And uh, yeah. so so so, if anything, I do remember that Deventinib, which is another multi TKI with CMET inhibition, similar to uh, the cabozantinib, uh, was an efficacy trial, but it was negative. Wh why the Deventinib was negative, and why the cabozantinib was positive? Well, they are different molecules, right? Uh, cabozantinib, I think, has probably a little broader kinase profile. I, th I think the main question for us is, is CMET an important target in liver cancer? And the data that, drew, that drove the Tevantinib study was a retrospective look at an all-comers study in second line that when they looked at CMET expression by immunohistochemistry, those patients had a worse prognosis and they did better with Tevantinib. And that was the basis for the phase three study. And that phase three study attempted to use a biomarker, immunohistochemistry, and it failed. And one of the biggest failures is the control arm did much better than anyone expected. And I think it raises the question of at least measuring CMET by immunohistochemistry, is that a meaningful measurement? You know, we know that there's genomic changes in CMET in liver cancer amplified, and maybe that's the group that's really CMET driven and, you know, should be selected for targeting. But I think we could say that by immunohistochemistry, that does not hold up as a robust biomarker for response. Why was this study positive versus the other? I think the biggest thing is the molecule. I think the molecule is, is different. And number two, they didn't focus on a false biomarker. I, I totally agree. If anything, really, my, my, my humble contribution to the study, which was really in great collaboration and really came with the same thoughts with the sponsor, is that we clearly understood that uh, what uh, was interpreted as being CMET uh, activation, which was measured in the Tevantinib study at 50 percent, 3 to 4 plus expression of the immunostaining, uh, would not be a requirement to get on the study. Tevantinib required that, so they really only took highly selected patients with high CMET uh, expression, while in the cabozantinib study it was for all comers. And this is really an important component, which of course was further solidified by exactly as Dr. Finn is saying, the uh, high value and the broad aspect of that multi-TKI, which we're definitely very impressed about the positive results of that of that drug. And I would like to ask, uh, so Mr. Sushi, any experience or any perception in regard to cabozantinib from Japan? Yeah, Kawazantin, uh, uh, unfortunately, Japan cannot join the global study. The company uh, did not, <laughs> did not uh, uh, invite. Oh, don't worry. A lot of companies <laughs> did not come our way no, no, either. No, so no, no. Don't uh, take it personally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, Japanese company have a has a license now, and uh, it, it's now about to start the uh, bridging phase two study. So we are... We are, uh, after finishing that trial, then we uh, we can. Uh, uh, I believe we can use we can use it. Use okay, it that's great. Uh, it's good to be excited about yes, it. That's yes. that's great. So so if anything, uh, last point. Uh, th this is uh, this is fascinating. If anything, you know, sorafenib. Out of nothing, we have also limvatinib, which uh, we're waiting for the approval. We have the rigorafenib, already FDA approved. Nivolumab was conditional approval in the U.S. at least for now. And we have cabozantinib. This is really moving from one drug to five drugs in like, literally barely one year. That's really quite impressive. And with this said, as we already heard from uh, Rich as well, there is more to come. And the question is, uh, the remisirumab, we don't have the data yet, uh, but uh, what's the story with the high FP and uh, why out of running the press release saying that this is a positive study and what, 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 what's your expectation or thoughts? So I think the um, remisirumab data are also very interesting. And in the REACH study, which looked at the efficacy of um, ramosirumab in, in HCC in second line, I mean, this was a negative trial. But they did a retrospective analysis, and they found that patients with a high AFP level, the cutoff was five, 400, um, that they have a poor survival on the placebo arm, 4.2 months. And when they were treated with ramosirumab, it was improved to 7.8 months, so clearly a significant improvement. On the other hand, patients with a lower AFP level had a good median overall survival of around one year, and this was not further improved by ramosirumab. And based on these data, they started the REACH-2 study, 
We have now a press release indicating that ramocirumab is uh, significant better than placebo in this group of patients with a high AFP value. But what we also have heard already is that the control arm in this REACH2 study was much better compared to the REACH1 study. So, and there are already some indications that the median AFP level was lower in the, in the control arm um, of, of uh, uh, the REACH2 study. So I think we really need to have a further discussion on the value of AFP and it, what I think is really clear that it's a highly prognostic marker, most likely not only in second line but also in first line therapy. And maybe we really need to look more in detail on the efficacy of, of all these different drugs in this high AFP level uh, um, patient group to decide which drug might, might be the best possible drug. Well, of course, and we'll wait for that data. And of course, this was the rice reminder of the nice data that we heard from Dr. Kudo in regard to lymphatinib as well.